are we ready? We are ready. All right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad those of us who could stay for Sunday school were able to do so. I have changed a lot of what I was planning on doing this morning with this lesson from the music to pastor and other things. It just, it went along with this lesson in ways that are taking it in a little different direction. Um, we're in Romans, which I find a little difficult sometimes, I mean, to translate it into ways that you want to understand. Um, Romans is, and I'll read from this commentary, is both the most challenging of Paul's letters to understand and the richest in what he calls his gospel. Paul quoted Habakkuk in Romans to set the tone for the entire book, the righteous will live by faith. Only through faith in Christ may eternal life be found. And eternal life cannot be earned through works, which we heard that last Sunday, although works are important. Eternal life is not inherited by ancestry, although that's not unimportant. Eternal life, the life of salvation, is found only in faith that trusts God to save us. And some things that Haley said in the children's chat, not the plunger, <laughs> but white as snow. One thing, which I don't know if Haley would remember, she was little, but I know Natalie who was here and a few other adults now who were kids. We had a song we sang, White as Snow. White as snow, white as snow, though my sins be as scarlet. Lord, I know, Lord, I know that my sins are forgiven. And the way they're forgiven is Jesus Christ. He died and was resurrected. And we're going to get into that with this lesson, Peace with God. And Josh's song, I'm always so touched by their music. <laughs> Quiet My Soul, sung so beautifully by Josh. And I wrote all this down. I'm trying to scribble as he's singing. When we have quiet in our soul, we can have peace with God. And when we can become closer to him and live our lives according, whoever has ears, let them hear. Another song. And when the pastor was talking about praying and hearing what God is saying to you, this lesson for two weeks, every time I read through it, I couldn't get my mind around the point I wanted to make and bring it where it's easily understood. Sometimes it's hard to understand what Paul's telling us. But when the pastor said, open your hearts and eyes and let him reveal to you what is supposed to be understood, we have to open our hearts to it and our ears to get what we're supposed to get. We can't focus on what we're supposed to be doing in our mind, what we think has to be done. Let's listen to what God's telling us. And the pastor said to serve him better. It's not to serve him more. It's not all we do, is it? Because if we do too much, we're really falling short. We're scattering ourselves too thin. We can't do a really good job for him when we do everything for him in our mind. We have to do better. And when we serve him better, it's with our hearts. All right. Before we start our scripture, I want to have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for allowing us to be in your house this morning. And we ask that these words from Paul and through all the writers of our scripture, let it come to our hearts and our minds 
and let us understand what we're supposed to do. We just ask that you lead us and guide us in all the ways that you want, not what we want, what you want. Let us be open to you. We ask that you be with all those that are suffering, dear God, those that are in need, not just financially, spiritually, in every way. You see the need. You see the hurt. You see every one of us inside and out, dear God. Just be with those that need you. Just be with us that we may bring your word to understanding. Amen. All right. This morning we're in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to read this scripture through. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Okay, when you go back in Romans, you're going to see what Paul's talking about. And having established that the life of Abraham is relevant to the Christian, Paul uses the connection, the connecting word, therefore, for two things. First, the phrase, been justified through faith, summarizes all of his thoughts in Romans 1 through 4. And second, the phrase, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This introduces a theme that undergoes much expansion and explanation in the verses to follow. Our sins invite God's wrath. Our justification from him by faith results in peace. Um, As Paul has explained, and as you read further into the gospel, we'll explain more. Since God has forgiven our sins by means of a substitutionary atonement, which is the death of Jesus, no basis remains for God to impose punishment on those who accept his terms. Christians need not fear judgment from God. And... In the second verse, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. One thing I thought in this commentary that's worth noting, if anyone wants to jot this down, grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. What he did Well, it's the reason we are here. It's the reason we are able to be Christians. And the word hope, as frequently used today, is often not what the Bible means hope. Um, You've heard the phrase, if someone's being sarcastic, well, one can only hope. That's not what hope is. 
That's not what it means. The New Testament uses the word hope in the sense of confident expectation of something good. For the one in Christ, there is no doubt. The quality of hope hinges on the character of the one in whom hope is placed. What more needs to be said? When we are in Christ, when we are in Christ, we have peace, grace, and hope. The concept of hope is so important to Paul, and this is a note to write down too, that he uses the word hope 17 times just in this book. So hope is so important, and it's not a sarcastic remark. It's genuine. We have it. We know. Verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Who likes to go through perseverance and suffering? I should say, who wants to go through suffering to gain perseverance? These are all qualities that we need and we want, but it's not easy to have our faith, is it, when we're going through hard times, whether it's illness, different things to different people. Pastor mentioned different instances that he saw at the hospital. That's a little piece of the world. How much is there? The suffering in so many different ways. But when we do when we know the Lord and we have our faith and we are at peace with God, it makes it so much easier. And one of the things I wanted to touch on too is our job as Christians, when we have the relationship with God, it's to reach out to others. We have got to bring others to know what they're missing. The lives that's torn up from drugs, from mental illness, that can be helped. But we're missing the opportunity. We've got to reach out. We've got to go out into the world. That's our job. And when we mentioned serving him better, not just more, do it in a way that's worthwhile, that's going to change somebody's life. We've got to bring people. These pews should be jam-packed. We had a time where we couldn't come. We know that. Let's get everybody in here now who needs it. That's our job. Let's do our job better. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul's clarion call in the book of Romans is, I am not ashamed of the gospel. How many times, and I can say I've done this, we get in this group of people, we're in a crowd, we don't even witness. We don't even show that we're Christians. We can't do that. Be strong. Be not ashamed. A nuance of the idea of not ashamed is to not be dishonored, which is how the same word is translated in Corinthians. False fronts and false hopes lead to both. But authentic hope in the Lord and in his faithfulness is neither. We are not fools to hope in God's love. This hopeful, faithful approach to life is not self-generated. God changes us and empowers us by pouring out his love into our hearts. And how did he do that? What big way? We're going to get into that. He died for the ungodly. He sent his son to die for us. For all the people. And when you look back at that time, the Jews and Gentiles, did they get along? 
They were two different groups, weren't they? The fact that Christ died for the ungodly is at the center of our Christian faith. That was a monstrous crime, the murder of the innocent Son of God. Paul's insight, though, is that while the enemies of Jesus had nothing but malice in their hearts, God had planned all along for his son's death to be the means of salvation for humanity. Not just for the Jews, his people, for the Gentiles, for the Romans, for everybody. There's, it's not for one set group. There's no chosen favorite. It's for all of us. The first three chapters of Romans deals with the fact that all sinned and are therefore unrighteous, unjustified, and unholy. Paul was not speaking of careless morality or occasional mistakes. We all make them, and I'm speaking for me. The ungodly who turn their backs on God and his expectations knowingly, willingly, and decisively in their preference for sin and its temporary pleasures. But as Paul says in the beginning of the letter, the ungodly are without excuse for their sins. And that includes all of us. There's no excuse for turning our back on God and not living our life the way he wants. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. Paul says, are you willing to die even for a good person? You know someone who does everything right? They're a good person. You really like them. But would you step in front of the gun for them or whatever circumstance? What came to my mind when I was reading this? What about any person? Someone we don't know. How many stories do you hear about people sacrificing themselves for a stranger, you know, jumping in the river when someone's drowning? They save them, but they drown. That's been in the news here lately. Total strangers. But my gosh, what a reward in heaven. We live for what's here on earth. We live here for the temporary we have got to focus on eternal life. What Jesus did for us, he died and was resurrected so we could live eternally in heaven. What better way to go? I mean, what better place to be? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we weren't good people, we weren't righteous. He died for us. What a sacrifice. So not only are you jumping in a river to save a stranger, you jump in to save someone you know is horrible. They've done awful things. But you want to save their life. And we do that to give them a chance. We've got to... Give them a chance to come to know Christ. And that's a, a big demonstration there of sacrificing your life. But we could do that every day. We can do that in ways that we don't even know. I mean, just witness to somebody by your actions, by things you're not even trying to do. When you have that relationship with God, that's what you do. You show it. You live it. Since we have now been justified by his blood, by his death, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? The death of Jesus paid the price for our sins, a price we could never pay on our own. We are now counted as righteous because we are justified by his blood. We can be at peace with God. The work of Christ has been done. We are new creatures, we wear a new name, and we have a new destiny. Because of Jesus' work, 
our faith and God's grace, we no longer need to fear the future. We respect the mighty wrath of God, but we do not fear it because we have forgiveness through faith in Jesus. Don't be afraid to sacrifice. Don't be afraid to reach out. And in the big picture here, don't be afraid to give your life for someone else. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? The ungodly, the unrepentant sinners are still God's enemies. Sin severed the relationship between sinner and creator. But God has provided the way by which those who are separated from him can come back. The new relationship is one of being reconciled. Salvation involves being returned to an ongoing relationship with God. And reconciliation comes only and always by the death of his son. Now that Jesus is alive and reigning as Lord, how much more will he help those who have accepted his gift of salvation? We can have no doubt that Jesus will return and complete God's plan of redemption. Jesus' resurrected life and reign is the firm basis for the assured hope of our own resurrection. If our hope in Christ goes only as far as this life, then we are able then we are to be pitied for having believed a lie. Have you ever heard that? I I read a lot. And in a book I was reading, a person was having an argument with an atheist. And they were telling them, what a fool you are. You believe this? This isn't even true. Well, I'd rather live on the basis it is and have eternal life than to Follow your way and have eternal damnation. So, and that's what that means. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul's phrase, not only, but we also, is an expression meaning there is more. We have been reconciled or reunited with God. We have been saved from sin and death by means of his grace. And as a result, yes, we can boast. We have now received reconciliation that results in being restored children of God. Through our faith in Jesus Christ, our hope is secure and our joy is complete. All of what Paul described comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, Brett talked about living under the law. We have a new law, don't we? Jesus Christ. That all changed. The old way all changed. We were set free, but we have to accept that freedom. We have to accept his death and resurrection and accept that gift that God gave us. On a grand scale, we understand the truth of Jesus' teaching. The God of all creation chooses to love and save his enemies rather than hate and destroy them, at least for now. But we must take that grand scale down to the level of the individual person, beginning with ourselves. Although we live in fearful times, We are not to fear the future. Though people around us fear many things, we are not to let fear of such things control us. The key always is to focus on the future Christ has prepared for us and made possible by the price of peace that Jesus paid on the cross. Christ's death has brought about our peace with God. When we have that peace with God, we live the life God wants us to live. It's up to us to spread the word, 
He died for everybody. So many people won't come to church. They feel they're not good enough. None of us are good enough. We're not here because of being righteous. We're here for being forgiven. And when we live a life that God wants us to live, that's the connection with him. When we live that life, it changes everything, and we need to reach others. Let them know you are good enough. This is for all of us. And that's one thing I don't, I'm not on Facebook, but I love that we can share this because how many people are going to hear? Well, there's another church service, but what they need to hear, you're good enough. He died for you, so we've got to let people know. We've got to reach as many as we can. This time in our lives, there's so much mental illness the pastor spoke of. Drug addiction. They feel like they're in a dark place and they can never come out. Let God be that light. Let us be the light shining for God and bring them to him. So the lesson in Romans was peace with God, and we have that peace through Jesus Christ. Let's live for him, because he died for us. And let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that you sacrificed him. For even though we are all sinners, you still loved us. We still have a chance. Those that turn away, those that don't accept you, there's still time. Come to know God. Come to see that light. Let him change your life. We ask that you be with all those in need, dear God. Be with all of those watching and all of those hearing this, that they can come to realize your death was for them. Let us go this week. Live up to our potential. Let us work better for you, dear God. Amen.